I would be lying if I said that I hadn't driven home crying in the car on more than one occasion. You know, um, I, I would be a complete liar if I said I hadn't affected me mentally um, for days on end. I think that um, most, most people who I know who are perfectionists by nature um, and overachievers, you know, I said that too at the start, by nature, we're also incredibly hard on ourselves. Yeah. And I think that um, before anyone has criticized anything I do, I, I, have, I have voiced it all. Hi, welcome to the Tarun Stevenson Leadership Channel. I'm your host, Tarun Stevenson, and we are all about helping you lead, communicate, and grow to your full potential. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite podcasting app, don't forget to subscribe and follow so that you can stay up to date with all our latest episodes. All right, here's the latest episode. Let's get into it. I am here with Marion Wright and she is a senior secondary leader. She is a host of an incredible podcast called Favourite Friends. She's a millennial leader. She's a mum to be. It's just like you're doing everything at the moment. Marion, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm also moving house. Yes, you are. There you go. (laughs) See the boxes, but I'm choosing a pandemic to do all my major life transition in. And just in case having your first baby wasn't enough, you just thought you'd throw a couple of other things in, yeah? I was born an overachiever, Tarun. What can I I say? (laughs) I see that. I see that. How are you coping with pandemic? Have you got cabin fever? It's been an interesting time. Yeah. Um, it, I, yeah, admittedly, yes. Um, you know, there's been a lot of interesting commentary around how introverts are experiencing the the pandemic and people yeah. are saying, you know, introverts are probably loving it and yeah. having the best time ever. But um, I, there have been moments where I've really struggled with, okay. um, you know, how the way we do relationships and connection has changed and, yeah. Um, yeah, there have been some days where I'm like, man, I'm not coping, but um, I'm I'm getting there. I think we all, you know, we had to cope. We had to figure out a way to do it. So absolutely. And so you you've gone, you know, gone down the introvert r- route pretty quickly there. I mean, we before we started recording, we were talking about the whole thing of introverts in the leadership. And um, so why don't we just start there because you brought it up. Um, okay. Introverts see. I consider myself an introvert and most people say I wouldn't have picked you as an introvert because, you know, I'm a public speaker and, you know, I do podcasting and, and you seem to like, you know, be quite confident and quite talkative and you don't seem to fit the, I guess, the stereotype of an introvert. What do you think an introvert is and how do, how how do you define that and what's that, that mean for you? So I'm going to answer your question with a question for you. Mm. What What is the introvert stereotype? I don't know. I guess a lot of people say that, you know, introverts are not talkative. They're quiet. They, you know, tend not to be very outgoing, maybe sit by themselves quietly in the corner in a, in a crowded room. Uh, They're shy. Shy. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. See, and... I mean, what do, what do you say about it? Do you think that that's a, a thing or is it? So introversion for me um, really has to do with emotional energy, right? Yeah. And how, how we um, fuel ourselves as human mm. beings. And I think there's, there's loads of stuff written about the topic, but for me, um, it really has to do with, with stimulus, how, how, you know, you as a human taking the stimulus in your environment, how you process and then how you relate to other people. A lot of people assume that introverts don't have social skills, (laughs) you know, aren't capable of, of, of leading, you know, or aren't capable of, of having quite a rigorous social life. Um, Introversion for me is really about how, how we recharge. Yeah. And how we sort of regulate our emotional energy. So, um, you know, you and I are friends. That we're sure. quite similar in in what we do. We we do speak publicly. We do um, lead. But um, for us, our recharge and and where we draw energy from really comes from from having time alone and yeah. time away Great. from stimulus. 
and, and our best work um, sort of happens when, when we've done that correctly and we've yeah. done that right. Um, extroverts for me, you know, there are times when I come across extremely extroverted when I'm yeah. in a room of people or when I'm, when I'm doing something that requires social engagement. Um, but if I, if I were to do that constantly, I, I would be in a deficit of emotional energy and I think that's where I, I withdraw and I just I can't take in yeah. any more stimulus um does that answer your question yeah no I think you've hit it on the head because that's how I feel as well you know I I'm quite comfortable talking to people I'm quite comfortable on stage I'm quite comfortable you know in, in the public sphere if you like but I get depleted I get peopled out and then I need time just to sit by myself or be by myself to recharge. So what, what are the things that you do to recharge? How do you find, you know, because I mean, I've got to be honest, I kind of like lockdown. I kind of like this. I mean, I'm a pastor of a church and pastors of churches are meant to like visiting people. And I kind of like being in lockdown. Am I allowed to say that online? Somebody's going to see this and think you just that's did. terrible. So I just <laughs> And there's no edits. I just told you I don't edit this show. So <laughs> it's out there now. But uh, yeah. I feel recharged because I've had actually yeah. so much time to just sit yeah. and yeah. contemplate. What about yeah. you? Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, it's similar for me. Um, I think for, for an introvert, like I need that time to internally process. Yeah. And I know when I haven't done that, that internal work that that it really affects my output um there there are times when I actually do just need to be by myself and read you know I read I read a lot yeah. um I also am a millennial who watches a ton of Netflix mm. <laughs> because I just I switch off and I actually really love just just watching something by myself yeah. Yeah. um I go for walks I I you know catching up with a really good friend and mm. having a really um you know in-depth conversation about something is also mm. a way for me to recharge. I think, you know, it's interesting you say you've kind of loved lockdown. I, I have two in the sense that I think where I have been able to engage with people, um, there's been a depth to, to the connection that you have. Mm. It's not like you're um, at parties and, and living that life, yeah. you know, at, a, at a, just a superficial level all the time, like you can sometimes. Um, it's, it's allowed me to, to have really like meaningful connection, which yeah. I think as an introvert, I draw energy from not like, you know, yeah, like, you know, just, yeah, I, um, no, I, I think the great, great thing about what's happened, at least from a family perspective, is we've had to be really intentional about how we connect with people, you know, and because we've been so limited in who we can connect with, we're very choosy about, mm. you know, those, those times where we get together. And I think that mm. that's probably been a good thing, um, ha having to be intentional, you know, even with my own kids, just having mm. to make the time to really, you know, go deep with them and spend time with them rather than just rushing through life and, you know, fobbing off those moments that would normally be consumed by the day to day. And so I think I've really enjoyed that personally. Mm. Yeah. The pace of it has been um, really delightful actually, mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's probably where I, I differ. Pace is something that I, I find frustrating as a leader I often want to go a hundred miles an hour. I want to make decisions. I want to do things. I want to get things done. And so that's probably, it's been good for me, but it's also been frustrating because it's forced me to slow down and it's forced mm. me to just say, okay, if I can't get it done today, that's okay. Mm. It'll mm. still happen eventually. Mm. So how do you find pace? Are you somebody that likes, you like to get it done or are you more just to plot it out and take your time? I, I think um, the, one of the ways that I, I do work is that I love, man, I love getting stuff done. Like I'm yeah. a list person. I am a Gantt chart person. I am like all about the timelines, you know, <laughs> I am, I'm big on, on organization, but I'm incredibly methodical in the way yeah. that I do things. And okay. I don't, um, I never, what makes me incredibly uncomfortable is delivering something that, that I know is not ready and I know it's not right. And in my gut, you know, I know that it's not quite at the point that it could have been. Yeah. And I sure. think that that's where, um, 
I think the um, the amount of thought that I have to put into something at inception can can be frustrating to other people I work sure. with, because um, the the work that I have to do to get my head around what what I want the endpoint to look like, yeah. and and to know that I've consulted everyone and been informed, um, you know, as much as I need to be, um, that that is something that I need to get a hundred percent right in my yeah. head sure. before then I go forward. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, COVID has kind of thrown a spanner in the works with, with loads of things, you sure, know, sure. that, that I, I had ready to, to go and, and kind of envisioned happening. But um, I guess it's given me time, time to think, which, which is also quite a luxury. You yeah. know, we don't always get that time to really, really think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. So just before I, I want to go back to thinking, but I just want to back you up a little bit. You, you were talking about um, you don't like to produce substandard work or, you know, you like to do it, at, uh, make sure you've done it well and you, you've, you've worked through the process efficiently. I'm kind of a more uh, build the plane in the air while you're flying kind of guy. And I, I believe in iteration. So it's like, this is 1.1 and then next yeah. week I'll do 1.2 and yeah. 1.3 and we'll keep Have improving. You, it's the, uh, like it's the WD-40 thing. Yeah. Have you heard that story? No, t- 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 tell me, you... tell me, tell me what the story so is. So how the guy, the guy who invented WD-40, like mm. it's called WD-40 because it was the 40th iteration of it. Right. The first version of it was called WD-1, okay. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And what we use now is, is the 40th version of it. And that's why it's go. called that. There yeah. you go. So would you call yourself yes. a perfectionist? Yes, but I would yeah. like to also say I'm in recovery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we could say that. That's all right. So yeah. how, do you, how do you thread that line? Because I think, I, I mean, I've worked with a lot of leaders that are perfectionists and that can really sabotage their ability to mm-hmm. uh, produce their vision or to create their mm-hmm. vision because they get so bogged down in making it perfect. Um, how do you walk the line? I think it's important to have high standards and, and to produce quality work, whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's a point where you have to say, it's good enough, let's go to market and let's keep improving it as we go. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that you have a method to uh, balancing that? Yeah, I, I think, um, gosh, like perfectionism can be so crippling, you know, if, if, you, if you let it get to that point. Yeah. And I think there have been times in my career where it, where it probably has crippled me yeah. um, and, to, and almost like pull me back from taking action. And I think... Um, I read something that Seth Godin wrote in his mm. blog about perfectionism. And, and one of the lines that he wrote was stop pretending it's what the world wants from you. Yeah. And I remember thinking oh, like, that's so true. Like yeah. no one else is, is actually standing there going now, when you release this, it better be perfect, <laughs> you know? That's it. And so I, I think, I think for me, it's been understanding the difference between excellence and perfectionism. Yeah, good. And not that they, they are two entirely different things. And, and, and excellence and quality, you know, mm. is, is something that is, that is completely separate. Yeah. Um, perfectionism in a state is, is completely unattainable. Well, it doesn't exist, does it? It really doesn't. No, it's not. And, and we, um, you know, and I, I have really like struggled with this in my head because I think that at the heart of it, it's really like a fear of failure. It's, you know, it's, it stems from an insecurity. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably how I've worked through it is, is understanding that the, the way that I am built and the way that I'm wired, yeah. I, will, I will do everything within my power to make it the best thing that, that it can yeah. be. And that, that is excellence, you know, and, and, um, and of course it can be made better. Like yeah. everything can. Sure. And if we, we, if we believe in continuous improvement, as a philosophy, then mm. I actually need to be okay with the fact that someone might point at it after it's released and go, have you thought about that? Mm. <laughs> and that's okay. That I doesn't that. mean, <laughs> I know. I <laughs> you know, that line where someone's like, can I give you some yeah. feedback? And I just keep smiling. Of it's like when, when you ask, how was that? And you, you know, the people that are going to be honest with you and the people that are going to pump yeah. your tires. And I mean, I'm blessed with a wife who is very honest with me. 
And so like whenever I finish a talk, if I ask her how it was, I know she's going to say, yeah, well, it wasn't your best work, but it wasn't bad. But I want that feedback. When I ask her, I want honesty. If I want to be pumped up, I'll ask my mom or something and she'll probably say yeah. it was amazing you know so it's just I think we've got to have those people in our life that can speak honestly to where we're at because uh, you can sometimes get really in your own head uh, especially if you put a lot of energy into it and start believing that you've you've just reinvented the wheel uh, when it may not be all that and we need those people to sort of keep us grounded would you say so? Yeah, but I think, do you think there's also some some merit in knowing whose voice is to trust, right? Yeah, and knowing, totally. um, um, you know, I think everyone's always got a critique. Yeah. Like we, we, we just, we love, you know, everyone's got an opinion on something. Yeah. And so I think probably one of my biggest um, lessons has been, has been learning to listen to the right voices and learning to trust those voices and, and learning um, to, to that, you know, might also mean like learning to, to stop listening to the voice in my head yeah. and not yeah. always trusting um, the perception that that creates either. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, there's definitely some balance in that because you can't take in everyone's critique all the time that's it's just a killer yeah i think you've got to be really careful about who you let speak into your life you know that ancient saying don't cast your pearls before swines lest they trample it underfoot you know some Mm. people just won't get what you're doing or they will critique you not because they want to help you but they actually just want to tear you down and i mean so so, can i can i ask you a question how do you know um how do you know which voice to listen to? How do I know voice which voice? I'm actually yeah. pretty. I'm I'm pretty uh, cautious when I when I listen to people or ask people yeah. for their opinions because, yeah. I mean, deep inside, I'm. Um, I I started out as a bit of an artist, you know, as a musician and a songwriter, and so and artists are very sensitive to criticism. And for a long time, I couldn't actually hack it if somebody gave me feel. I'd get upset if my if my wife gave me a critique on something, and I trust her implicitly. But uh, if Mel said something that I didn't want to hear, it would really hurt me. And so for a long time, I wouldn't ask her for her opinion. Um, and so I think there's still a little bit of that in me where I'm very cautious about who I ask for advice. But I, what I have this, it's not hard and fast, but I, I try to have a couple of people who are ahead of me in my journey. So whatever I'm doing, I look for the people that are in my world that maybe have gone before me. They've done it. They know what it's like. And then I, those are the people that I actually want to speak into my life or to have an opinion about what I can improve because they've actually got credibility. Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking people who I lead what they think in the sense of my critique, I might ask them generally speaking, but uh, not to critique me. I want somebody that's actually got credibility. Um, And I think it's, it comes out of relationship too. So you've got to be, Mm. you've got to start with the people you trust. Uh, If you can't trust them, then you you don't want to lay yourself bare because that, that can be devastating as well. Mm. Are you, are you a Brené Brown fan? I've got to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time listening to Brene Brown. I mean, I'm a familiar with her work, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I honestly don't know a lot about what she uh, teaches. But tell me, what, what, what do you so, get from her? <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan. I, I think okay, she's great. Um, I may I become a fan. I also think she's very funny. This. I also think she's very funny, which just appeals to me great. so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I watched you know I've read her book so she's got a, a couple a few books now but there's a yeah. um one book called Dare to Lead which I really loved yeah um but she also did a a Netflix special called um like the Call to Courage or something okay. like that and um she's a great storyteller Tareen I think I think you'd really like her yeah, um but she speaks a lot about um leadership as um you know, being in the arena, the, mm-hmm. she's, a lot of her, her content, um, her work is around um, vulnerability. And mm-hmm. so she speaks about, you know, leadership as, as being this incredibly vulnerable thing that, that we do with our lives and with um, ourselves, you know, as people. Yeah. And um, she says that, you know, unless you're in the arena with me 
and you're covered in blood and sweat yeah. and and have been kicked and um you know have, have just um just given everything she says you don't get to have a say yeah. unless you're in the yeah. arena with me yeah. and i think that 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 has probably been the deciding factor on who i listen to if you're That's not big. out here risking everything with me yeah then then you don't get to have a say yeah. and um that was something i i had to just um decide quite quickly that that yeah. was where i was going to draw the line about who got to have a comment yeah. on on how i how i led or what i produced yeah. that's yeah. that's really good because there are so few yeah. people that will actually do do that uh those yards with you isn't it you know i mean i totally i've, I've spoken about mel you know because i trust her implicitly because we've we've fought in the trenches together you know we've we've yeah. encountered got encountered so much together as a couple that i know she's got my back and i know that yeah. when she gives me a critique it's not because she's trying to be cruel but she's trying to help me be the best i yeah. can be and you know there are very few i think there are very few people in my life that are actually like that you know there's yeah. I could count on one hand how many people I trust like that. Cause yeah. like you say, leadership is vulnerability. If you're going to lead really well, you have to be prepared to open yourself up and be yeah. authentic with somebody. So and get kicked in the process. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how do you, how do you guard yourself against the naysayers and the critics and the keyboard warriors when you're being vulnerable but you know that what they're saying, it really has no impact on your life. I mean, like, I, I do a bit of Facebook advertising. And one of the things that really amuses me when I'm advertising my products or one of my workshops, I've constantly got people that would jump on there and comment and start critiquing my work when they don't even know what my work is. They've never been to a workshop, but they'll start, they'll take the headline and they'll give me this diatribe about why what I'm doing is a load of garbage. And at first when it happened it used to really upset me i'm like who the hell are you why are you jumping on my advertising and criti criticizing me when but i got to the point where i'm like why do i care they don't know anything they've got no permission to speak into my life so now i just delete those comments and i don't even acknowledge them but um how do you handle because even though you don't let people speak into your life if they've uh not been through it with you there's still people that think they've got the right to do it. There's still mm -hmm. people that think they know you. How do you handle that stuff? Um, I would be lying if I said that I hadn't driven home crying in the car on more than one occasion. You know, um, I, I would be a complete liar if I said I hadn't affected me mentally um, for days on end. I think that... Um, most most people who I know who are perfectionists by nature um, and overachievers, you know, I said that too at the start, by nature, we're also incredibly hard on ourselves. Yeah. And I think that um, before anyone has criticised anything I do, I, I have I have voiced it all. You yeah. know, I have I have actually um identified every single flaw that exists in yeah. in not only the work that i that i do but also at times in me and yeah. so then when someone says something critical there's there's this um this wrestle in you where where it's like are they affirming what i fear the most yeah. <laughs> you know where at my absolute core i think i'm not good enough um are they affirming that yeah. and so i think i think for me um, and I, I, you know, I can only really speak to to my own experience. I think for me, it's it's having um, a really strong grasp on who I am, what what I stand for, my value, and my my belief system, yeah. and um, and and the monologue, the narrative that is in my head, and and the the self talk, the way I speak to myself. You know how how we lead is is really a direct result of who we are yeah. right and so um the only way that i i have known to deal with it 
is to actually be completely cemented in, in how I see myself. Yeah. And that, you know, is far from perfect that I struggle with that at the best of times. Yeah. Um, but, but to know that what I've done and who I am is enough. And, and if someone doesn't agree with me, that's okay. Because yeah. at the end of the day, I'm accountable to me and um, the work that I did and, and no one will ever know or see, you know, yeah. um, what, what I did and, and the intention with which I did it. But, but it's enough that I know. And, and it's enough that, that there is a group of people who, who do see that and who do see me. And I think that's the fight, you know, the fight is really, really to maintain a hold of, of what, what you know about yourself and what you believe about yourself and what you value. And, and just accepting the fact that you're never going to please everyone. You know, like I have a colleague who always says to me at the end of anything and I get the angry email saying, Hey, that was crap. Mm. My colleague always says to me, 80, 20, mate, 80, yeah. 20, you yeah. can never win them all. Yeah. You, you can't ever, but, um, but you know, the 80% to aim for is, is really now the goal, <laughs> never, yeah. never yeah. the hundred percent. And yeah, I, I've actually found that uh, when you do the numbers, that uh, the the naysayers are far fewer than even twenty percent. Very often, they're in the five percent, six percent range. They're so loud. They're, they're so voices. loud, and it's so yeah. easy to think that they actually are the majority. And I, I've kind of had to become a bit of a data person when I find myself getting frustrated with mm. uh, your know, criticism or even public discourse. I to stop myself getting frustrated, I say, okay, show me the numbers. Tell me if this is actually a majority or do, can I just ignore this because it's not really, mm. a, uh, mm. not really what everyone thinks. And, and, you know, like I'm like, where's the pattern in the data to support yeah. this as yeah. well. Right. So it's not that it's just happened once, but has it happened again and again yeah. and again? Yeah. N no, if not, then, you know, we can, we can, we can take the 80 as a win. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like, so you, you talked a bit about identity and holding on to who you are. Mm -hmm. I find that now probably more than ever in history, we have this obsession with group identity at the expense mm -hmm. of the individual. You know, you, everybody wants to categorize you according to your whatever identity, you know, like we were talking about what are some of the, the labels that you've had to deal with as a leader, you know, you're a millennial, you're, uh, you're from immigrant parents, you're from Pakistan, you're, um, you're too young for the roles that sometimes you've taken on, you know, there's all these group yeah. identities that can be foisted on you, not even as a leader, but just as a person going through life. And it's almost like if you don't have the right group identity, uh, you can very quickly become swallowed up by the noise that's out there. How do you, how do you walk that line? Because, you know, mm. being a millennial leader, you know, millennials cop a bad rap sometimes. And uh, I don't think all millennials are what we, they're often described as in the group. Thanks thing. man. You, know, Thank you, you. <laughs> you, you, you are an exception to the rule, but no, I'm sorry. I should have said that. Um, no, but it's, it's easy to box people according to their label, you know, uh, yeah. you're an immigrant, you're a woman, you're a, you know, you're a white male, you're a this, you're a that. And how do you, how do you hold on to identity or how, how do you even I find your identity in the noise or the insistence that you must belong to a group or you must identify mm. with a group? That, that is a really Big and hard question to answer. I'm not. Well, I was I'm not you even. Had the answer because I don't. So. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how good of a job I'm going to do answering it. Um, it. You know, it's funny, right? And I. This is my long rambling response mm, to your go. very big and hard question. Um, I'm. It's funny. I think being. Um, being a migrant, so I, I moved to Australia when I was six. Mm. Um, I I grew up with, um, you know, my parents educated, they're English speaking, which is mm. why I sound the way that I do. Mm. And, you know, people have literally done a double take sometimes when I open 
tip of my mouth. Um, at, at uni, you know, I was studying teaching and I majored in English, which is also mm. very atypical for yeah. someone of my um, ethnic background. There were loads of people who were like, oh, I thought you'd be science or maths. And I was like, nah, man, I failed maths in grade 10. Yeah. No one wants me teaching their kids maths. Um, and so I always, you know, what theoretically what I have is, is something called a hybrid cultural identity where mm. I've um, pulled bits and pieces from, from my culture of origin, but also the culture I grew up in. And then, you know, I, I'm also a Christian. So part of my value system is it stems from there, not necessarily the country I was born in, which wow. is a Muslim country. Yeah. So, I, I'm a bit of a, a conundrum, you know, my husband likes to do this thing where he um, introduces me to people that, you know, who haven't met me and says, my wife just born in Pakistan, but she's actually an English teacher. And, you know, like it, there's this whole, like, um, I guess, talking point around yeah. that. So I say that to say that I think I've always been a bit of a mixed bag yeah. and I, I have been comfortable with it. Yeah. The biggest learning for me has often been about how other people perceive it. So I um, often have found that, you know, I forget that I'm ethnic until yeah. someone reminds me that I am. Yeah, right. Or I forget that I'm a young woman until someone reminds me mm. that I am. Mm. Um, I, I forget that English is my second language until someone reminds me that it is. Yeah. So I think... I, I wouldn't have picked it, by the way. Yeah. I still get stuff wrong, man. I'm a human. Sure. But I think, um, you know, to, to answer your question, mm. I think, I think there will always be a sense of that. And, and unfortunately we, we can't control people's perceptions. Yeah. We, we can't control how people have experienced race or age or, or gender. You know, I, I, I'm not responsible for the experiences that anyone else has had with a millennial. Mm. I'm only responsible for myself. And there are times when I can successfully challenge someone's perception. Yeah. Um, and I always, you know, I, I always like to default um, that they're, they're uneducated or uninformed rather mm. than go straight to, um, you know, you hate millennials or you hate migrants. Yeah, sure. um, and, and to perhaps consider that they haven't had a chance to, to engage with someone like me. Yeah. And um, I, think, I think that that's, that's probably the way I've had to go about it because otherwise it's too much energy. It's too exhausting and too consuming mm. to try and um, feel like you've got to fight for your right to be validated all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to answer your question simply, I would say I, I, I pretend I'm just like everyone else <laughs> <laughs> until, until someone treats me <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. And then, and then I cross that bridge when I get yeah. to it. You know, I, you touched on the fact that I'm, I'm young, you know, I'm, I'm 30 mm. and I, I've been in a, in a leadership role that has been incredibly challenging mm. and um, it's, it's required me to grow quite mm. quickly. And I mean, you know, to, to give you an example, I had to, I was part of a mass recruiting phase for um, you know, numerous about like a number of our campuses at the end of last year. Mm. And I was on interview panels with, with principals, like incredibly mm. accomplished principals. And <laughs> one of the principals turned to me and she said to me, um, now listen, I have recruited over 600 people in my career. Um, I have run this many businesses and she's, she's basically just going through a history of her, of her incredibly successful career mm. to say, this is how I recruit. Yeah. I'm not going to always stick to the interview guide. Mm. Um, I like to ask this kind of questions. This is how I do it. And then she stops and says, how many people have you interviewed over <laughs> the course of your life? And I said, um, probably about five, yeah. but I'm really good with people mm. um, and I, I actually think I'm quite insightful. And she went, oh, five's not a lot. And I said, no, it's not. But let's see how we go because I'm obviously here for a reason. Someone asked yeah. me to be here, right? Right. And she went, oh, yeah, I suppose. And so, you know, we sat in a room and we interviewed for like yeah. two or three days. And at the end of it, she turned to me and went, you are quite insightful. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> she went, oh, 
yeah, it was good. That was good. I really enjoyed doing that with you. I was like, nice. well, yeah, same. No. Nice. And so I think where where you could interpret it as criticism and where yeah. you could go cry about your lack of experience, um, I I was there. I was yeah. in that room. I I um knew that I didn't have you know six hundred recruitments under my belt. Yeah. But I knew that I had something to offer. Mm. And so that I think has been the way that I've sort of dealt with, with identity and, yeah. and labels and all of those things. So have you always been that brassy? Because that's, I mean, judging by the story that you've told, that was a pretty big power play on the part of the principal. She was trying to put you in your place and you fire back with, well, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm actually pretty good at what I do. Is that is that a personality thing or is that something you've had to develop over time? Um, that's definitely something I've had to develop over time. Okay. By nature, I, I was never that confrontational. Okay. Um, I you know, like I said, I'm an introvert, yeah. <laughs> you know, my my default is to always shirk back and to right. to be silent and um so that that is something that I have had to teach myself how to do, and I think as I've as I've gotten older and and become more sure of myself, um, it's become easier to do. And yeah. I I um, you know, like to think I do have a little bit of sass too, and you know me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My mum would say the same, but um, it. You know, it, it it saves me from from that moment where you do regret not saying something. Yeah. You know, and and that I've been in those t those positions too many times as yeah. well, where I have just given into that that introverted um, default to just yeah. sit back and say nothing and apologize. And I think that women do that too much already. And sure. so I just kind of got into a point where I just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, something I heard Gladys Berejiklian say just at the beginning of all the COVID lockdown and she was announcing all of the restrictions. And uh, when she was quizzed about whether she thought that they were reasonable, she said, now's not the time for leadership with regret. She said, Oof. we have to, we have to leave. Oh, she's, I'm not going to lie awake at <laughs> night wondering if I should have made that decision. I've just got to mm. go with my convictions. And I love that because, I mean, regardless of whether you like her as a political leader or not, I love mm. the fact that in tough times, leaders that lead well are the ones that uh, go with their convictions and they don't second guess themselves. They just lead with confidence based on what they know of the situation. And I think that there is a place for that. You've got to be able to do it. I think, um, you know, I, I really fear making mistakes. I fear mm. saying the wrong thing a lot. And I think, you know, a, a colleague once said to me, you know, at, at, at the time of decision making, did you think that that was, that was the wrong thing to do? Mm. And I was like, no, that was absolutely the right thing to do. And he was yeah. like, so how can it be a bad decision when, when yeah. at the time, with the information that you had, with the yeah. analysis that you did, that seemed like the best way to go forward. Now you right. have information now that you didn't back then. Yeah. So of course you can beat yourself up for, for what you should have done. Yeah. But, but at, at, at that moment, you know, that, that was the way forward. And I mean, consider, you know, the pandemic, yeah. we were making decisions for, for our campuses Um regarding the, the learning from home program and we, yeah. we're sitting in a room we we've got to make decisions quickly you know yeah. there's five campuses of of teachers waiting for us to yeah. to make a call now we we could have been like yeah. well let's do quite you know like a like a full-on analysis of our decision yeah. making you know that, that has to come you know in in retrospect but but it's like we've never navigated a pandemic. No, <laughs> that's right. No, nobody's you know? ever done what their, our leaders are doing now. Totally. And to, I, do you find, I, I find that the current uh, public discourse and even the way the, the media narrates a lot of what goes on is very deconstructionist in, in a sense. Like we look back on things that have happened and said, oh, you know, it was a disaster. The way we did it, you know, they should have done this, they should have done that. And I've always sort of thought to myself, you know, in the moment, Nobody had the information you had. You know, a lot of the time we're, we're, you know, we're in the midst of a conversation right now about 
uh, your racism and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, without going too far down that rabbit hole, I I, I think some of the conversations we're having, it's like, well, we're, we're reflecting back on something that, we weren't there decisions were made and no, maybe they weren't the best decisions, but they were made with the information that they had at the time or the Mm. experience or the, you know, the the culture and the environment. And so, yeah, we can learn from the past and move forward, but Mm. I find it really counterproductive Mm. to reflect and say, you know, to criticize the decisions that our past leaders made, like we could have, somehow done it better if we were in their shoes what what do you think about that oh I think um you know one this is such a it's such a hard thing for me to get my head around because I think you know even like to go back to what we went through with with coronavirus Mm. you know (laughs) there are times in the room where we sat there and we went we asked ourselves the question, is this the right thing to do? And I remember that everyone was silent and I said, well, I guess we'll know by the next pandemic, won't we? (laughs) And, you know, everyone (laughs) laughed, but it was like, how, how can we, how can we know? Um, how can we predict? And, and all we can do is, is move forward with the information that we will have, you know? And I, I think that, you know, I was, and, and during that time, I remember I was working from home and I was w- walking out and watching, we call Scott Morrison, Scotty in our house. Yeah. We still respect him, but <laughs> so I'm watching Scotty do all these, these press, you know, um, briefings yeah. and he's talking through um, what, 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 how the country's dealing with it. Yeah. And then I'm listening to all the critique and all the analysis and all the commentary. And I remember to my husband that, I, um, I just, I just cannot criticize what he's doing because I'm not in his seat yeah. and therefore I don't feel that I have a right to, because yeah. at, at my heart, I know I don't want to be in his place making yeah. those calls. Yeah. And I think that that, that's the thing about, about leadership is that, you know, if you don't want a seat at the table, you know, yeah. then are you going to do what you can with the power that you have and, and work with the decision makers and, and, and influence within your realm or, or are you just gonna, you know, like the media does at times, just, just say, well, you know, two days ago this and now this, and that's clearly a terrible decision. And it's, it's almost become even worse with that whole sort of cancel culture where people troll back through your social media for seven years and find one little mistake that you made in a moment. And it's just like, we're Mm. obsessed now with, uh, dethroning leaders based on decisions that were made in the moment that, you know, if we were in the same position, I don't know that we could have done it better. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah I, yeah. And it, it's a terribly, um, you know, people, people think that leaders should be judged harshly or harsher yeah. than, you know, because they're, they're often in, in powerful positions in our society and, sure. and to, um, you know, there's a lot of power with, yeah. with those kind of positions. So I think um, that's where I, I always um, have to try and exercise empathy in that way to be like, could I have made that mistake? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Would I be going home and beating myself up and wanting to yeah. quit my job? Hell yeah. You yeah. know, um, but oh, who knows? It's, it's, it's a weird, weird world we live in. It is. And I, I think it's a really good reminder though, Marion, I'm glad you brought it up that, uh, that vast majority of us will always lead from the middle. You know, there's mm. very few people that sit at the top of the food chain and actually lead as, you know, the very top leaders. And mm. most of us answer to somebody else. And we've got to be careful how quick we are to criticize the job that the person above us is doing, because, the question is, you know, I, I have to remind myself of this often is could I actually do it better or do I just think I could because I'm not actually carrying the weight and the responsibility mm. that my leaders are carrying. And uh, I, I think it's a good reminder for all leaders is there's, we, we probably all need to take a good dose of humility every so often to keep ourselves in check. I think, I think there's, um, there's, 
great merit in in understanding that that leadership is really just at its heart about influence yeah. and making things better and you yeah. don't need to be in a formal position yeah. you know there's a big difference between authority and leadership sure. and and influence and i i think that culturally you know we we love leadership i mean i i work in education and yeah. we're all about like building leadership skills in young people yeah. but what about that that kid that like I'm pretty happy just just yeah. you know doing my thing and doing it well and you know I think that there's a lot to to say for making space for people to contribute meaningfully right as, as part of a team and, and understanding team dynamics without everyone kind of jostling for for that role of leadership because yeah. you know true productivity occurs when a lot of things work well together which includes having the right leader but also the right team yeah, if good. you've got a bunch of leaders working together um, because everyone thinks that that's the only way to to make change then yeah. we're never really going to get anywhere yeah and sometimes those people uh, actually have a greater influence on the group than anybody mm -hmm. realizes you know we i think we give far too much credence to the position uh, mm. rather than looking around the room and seeing who's actually influencing the mm. uh, the group. You know, I was talking to Dave Westbrook last, um, my last episode, and he said some, some leaders need to recognise that they're not actually the leader in the room. And, I mean, that's hard to swallow if your yeah. title says you're the leader, but you may yeah. not be the person that's actually calling the shots. And, this uh, is another Brené Brownism, but yeah. um, she says that leaders should be um giving stars not collecting them I like and it. i think that that um that that is definitely something that i have tried to adopt that Great. you know I, i'm in this position but but the position is to influence other people to yeah. to 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 rise up and and to feel that they have power to make yeah. change and to feel that they are skilled and to feel that they have a voice and when they succeed i succeed it's not yeah. it's not yeah. about me and what i've done and what i've got under my belt and so i think that, that that's a very different way of looking at leadership yeah. though and i i wonder how much of that comes from from the introvert in me yeah um Susan Cain, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's written this incredible book about introverts, actually. It's called yeah. Quiet. Okay. And um, she talks, she writes a lot about the quiet leader. Mm. And she says that, you know, many, there are many introverted leaders in our society who haven't actually ended up leading because they have a strong desire to do so, yeah. but because they've looked at whatever the situation is that they found themselves in and gone, mm. I guess I'll step up. <laughs> you know? Somebody needs guess, to. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. often they, they would rather not, yeah. you know, but, but there's something in them that knows that, that if, if they don't, then, then, you know, who will. And so yeah. I think that, that, that the heart of, of that desire to lead, there has to be um, that, that focus on, on other people and, and the greater goal, not really what you're getting yeah. out of it, you know? That's so good. I was reading an article about uh, introverted leaders just before uh, we got on because I thought I'd better just do some research. <laughs> <laughs> but Read one, Susan what, Kate's book. She's okay, good. Susan Kate, quiet. Yes. All right. Yeah. I'm, but, so one of the comments they make is that introverted leaders or introvert leaders build meaningful connections, and I think that's what you're probably, you know, al mm. alluding to here is that it's more about the people and it's more about the team than about your own accolade because mm. you can kind of uh, take it or leave it, the accolade, but if the team's winning, then you're winning. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I would love to continue this conversation for a lot, lot longer, but I don't want to take too much of your Friday night, but I think that's probably a good place to introduce your podcast because you've got a really sure. great podcast. I enjoy listening to it. It's called Favourite Friends. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, I mean, I could introduce it, but I think it's better if you just tell me about your podcast. And uh, it sounds like what you've just described is what, what motivated you to start doing this. Yeah, well, so, you know, outside of um, work and, and education, I... Mm -hmm. 
I love um, stories. I, yeah. I write a little bit, um, probably not as much as I have in the past, but um, I, I think that um, I've just, I've always just loved listening to other people talk about their journeys. Um, I said earlier, I am a Christian. So this, this podcast is a part of my church life. Sure. And so um, the, the podcast was born out of um, a magazine that our church actually published called Favourite yeah. Magazine. And in that magazine, we, we feature the stories of incredible women from all over our campuses. And it, they're not superficial stories. You know, no. they're gutsy, um, real stories of women that have just um, walked through incredible things. And yeah. I had to interview someone uh, for the magazine. And um, I record the, the interviews because mm. I can't remember anything. And we ended up speaking for about two hours and this, wow. this woman, you know, has such an incredible story. And at the end of it, I remember thinking, I wish someone could hear the conversation that we just yeah. had. Yeah. Um, because I think that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not the only one who was just yeah. so incredibly moved by it. So um, Favourite Friends was, was born out of that. It was a way right. to bring these stories and these conversations to women. Um, it's, it's pretty raw. It's pretty authentic. Yeah. Um, but the, the idea is that after listening to it, you know, you feel like you've been catching up with a couple of friends with a, right. cup, of, with a cup of tea mm. and, and really just, just feeling incredibly inspired yourself you know one of the women we featured um had a, a, a you know a journey of seven years to to become pregnant and and wow. her um her challenges around fertility and her journey with IVF but yeah. in that she also you know talked about her her journey with her mental health and her marriage and yeah. a whole bunch of stuff it's incredibly vulnerable stuff but um you know, C.S. Lewis says that, that friendship starts the moment when you say to someone, what, you too? I thought I was the only one, I love you know, it. I love it. and that, and I think that that is the, the heart of it, that someone goes, oh my gosh, like, I remember that feeling. I know that yeah. feeling. And, yeah. and it just makes you feel a little bit less alone. That's great. And, and I have listened to the podcast and uh, I can <laughs> say, really? uh, yeah, I have uh, more than once. I've got it in my podcast app and I actually really enjoy the stories. I think that they like you say, they're gritty, they're raw because I'm, I'm obsessed with storytelling. I love listening to yeah. people tell stories. And uh, I, one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is I just love listening to people tell me about their life and I don't care whether they're well known or not well known. I just love listening to the stories that people share because I think that that's where we, it's the oldest form of deriving meaning for life, isn't it? You know, storytelling mm -hmm. is the, the earliest form of education long mm -hmm. before there were schools or anything else. And, and I think that there's something so, so valuable about listening to the experiences and the journeys of other people mm -hmm. and the, the challenges they've overcome. So we're going to put the link for that podcast in the cool. description for here. But what I was, I was going to ask you, do you video your interviews? I haven't been because introvert, I, I hate people looking at me. <laughs> so I, I um, I've always tried not to, but loads of people have recently said to me, can you start recording them? And I'm yeah. like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, there's this whole plan behind the scenes to get them onto IGTV. Mm. Um, there's been a couple of times I've been asked to do the interviews live yeah. and I always say, you know, the whole point is for me not to like be in front of people, yeah. but um, that's, that's a, a way that um like this for example when i said yeah. where is this video gonna go <laughs> everywhere like, going somewhere <laughs> all um, three of my uh youtube videos <laughs> four now four. right um but, <laughs> but i think uh, i've just got to you know challenge myself and, and the but. irony is you are married to a filmmaker and very talented videographer so i just think why you have not tapped that potential uh in josh i have no idea because I, I i think the way you the way you interview i mean flip and heck you've been interviewing me on my own podcast today and it's the way you yes. draw you, you get people to talk about stuff that they're not going to talk about and i've listened to you yeah. interview people and you know how yeah. to draw the emotion out of people and i i think to be able to watch that, you know, to see facial expression, I just think would add another dimension to. Oh man, what you really? Do. Yeah, but I, I think, I think this it. is 
do it. This is like, you know what you were saying? You, yeah. you speak publicly, you're comfortable in loads of these situations. Yeah. Like I, I, I do it. And to an extent I am comfortable, but there's a part of me that doesn't always enjoy it. You know, I don't yeah. always enjoy the attention. I don't always sure. enjoy, um, you know, making myself that vulnerable, but perhaps that's one more thing that I've just got to do and challenge myself. But the good myself, thing is your so. guests can be the feature. Make them that's true. You don't that have is to be true. the feature. That's but, uh, true. Anyway, I that's will, that's my two cents. Take your point. I, I, I think you should do the, do the video. It's point. good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, very good, very Thanks. good. Marion, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you tonight. I, I think we need to do this again because I think uh, there's so much more that we can say about leading. God, and really? I've I've really enjoyed thoroughly uh, really? having you talk. Yes, I don't, why are you so was shocked? It bad? Why Why are you so surprised? It's like Friday night, man. I no. didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> Seriously, Friday night, everyone's relaxed. It's all good. It's all good. We're no, loose. It's We're It's been loose. really good, and I I want I want to keep talking leadership, but I'm uh, mindful of your time as well you need to go and spend time with your husband so before we wrap it up if people want to get in touch with marion i know you're not huge on social media but where can people find marion right and um we'll put the links in the description <laughs> so i am on instagram yeah. um i haven't been recently but i i will respond if you message me as you yeah. have been yeah um so i'm i'm marion dot right on instagram and that is actually the only social media profile no, no facebook <laughs> no facebook oh, well, facebook's not a millennial thing is it i do have a linkedin you have linkedin um, okay which I interact with casually. Yeah. Um, but I guess that those two are it. The, I live right. in Brisbane. Like, I'm sure you'll spot me somewhere <laughs> in public. Say hello. Yeah. But, yes, it's very unmillennial of me to, to not have a, a strong social media presence, isn't it? Well, you know, maybe it's that whole deconstructionist uh, bent of millennials now. You're just... Uh undoing what has been built by breaking us. the stereotype break the system no i love it yeah. that's good so we'll, we'll put the link for marion in the description marion thank you so much for your time it's been wonderful talking to you and uh look forward to doing it again soon pleasure thank you for having me hey thanks so much for tuning in i hope you got a ton of value out of that episode don't forget to let us know what you thought in the comments and if you have a topic you'd like us to cover next time we'd love to hear from you if you know anyone that would benefit from the content that we produce please like and share this channel and we look forward to having you next time on the tarun stevenson leadership channel